Well, welcome back, folks, to Sig Ray Chat. We are here with our first guest speaker from this morning, David Shanky, the Deputy Director General for the Energy Department of the Energy and Public Works area. Welcome back, David. How are you this afternoon? Very well. Thank you for having me. Mate, may I start off by saying a sensational speech this morning. I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I do have a number of questions uh, in relation to to what you spoke about this morning. The first one is, you, you spoke about the challenges that you're facing and the fact that community obviously is a hard, hard part to get on. I, I love the photo of Osnet in the ground. That's honest commitment right there. What are, what are the challenges with bringing the community together and how do we do it? Yeah, I think it's really tough. I think in, uh, in Queensland, for example, uh, we've only just seen the first deployment of our wind farms. So Queensland had their first wind farm back in, uh, back in the 80s, and it was up in a place called Windy Hill, actually near Cairns. And if you looked at that wind farm today, it's basically like uh, large windmills. It's quite small in size, um, but the technology that's being deployed today is so much more increased in size uh, that it's really quite a shock to the communities when they see it for the first time. So to give people a bit of an idea, uh, the, a wind farm that is deployed in South East Queensland today probably is, is as tall as 1 William Street in the, in the city oh, of Brisbane. Tall. So yeah, pretty tall. So they're starting to see the infrastructure being deployed. They're sort of thinking, well, this is perhaps a little bit more intrusive uh, than we wanted. And of course, the transmission that is associated with it uh, can also be uh, somewhat uh, challenging for people because people often move to regional areas, perhaps to uh, get away from city life, and suddenly you've got this kind of industrialization uh, moving near them. So I think that's the nub of the challenge, that in some senses, the wind farms and the places where they are located, uh, the people who are living on the, those properties, they welcome it because they're getting paid uh, to host those areas, but it's probably more the people are surrounding those areas uh, who are not getting any particular uh, financial compensation for it, uh, are seeing their views being disrupted, but they also have to deal with the construction impacts of that. And on top of that, the transmission, you can't really move transmission around too much. It has to go in a pretty straight line. Oh, so, um, yeah, so that's, you know, you can't really negotiate around the, that, those, uh, uh, those aspects. Now, we are really trying to get better at this stuff. Uh, having seen some of the impacts and listened to some of those concerns. Uh, for transmission, for example, we're looking at paying not just for the people who are hosting the land, but paying also for neighbour payments uh, for people who are visually impacted. Right. So that is something that Queensland's starting to do, and uh, we think that we, it will be reflected in other states. Um, and I think now that people can see the infrastructure that is happening with wind, uh, we can have a bit of a more mature conversation around it. I think some of the other issues that we're sort of seeing is that uh, a lot of our new lines will be a lot further out west and uh, they will be in areas where there will be less population, yep. in areas like Hewenden. So we do sort of think that, that that's going to be a significant part of it. Solar farms, very different kind of impacts. Uh, they do seem to be quite low. It's, it's a short, much shorter construction period, but also uh, quite low visual impact as well. We do get a few issues with glare, but it's it's a much reduced level of concern. Well, what about all the space in the desert? There's lots of sun in the desert, isn't there? There is, there is lots of sun, but it, it really is a transmission question. Like how right. much transmission can we afford to build out to yep. those areas? and how much uh, can we get out on those transmission lines. So we are building, you might have heard of a line, we're building a line called Copper String, which is out to Mount Isa, yep. uh, to bring a, a lot of renewables online there. But even with a line of that size, it can only probably supply, uh, host about two gig, two to three gig of renewables. So there are limits, physical capacity limits. Do you lose much? Or when you're transmitting the, the electricity, do you lose much? Out, out you do, you, you do. do. So in, in Queensland is a massive, massive state. So we're really uh, hoping that when we're building these lines up north, they are to be fed into industry that we want to see develop up here. 
because the distance to travel to move energy all the way from the uh, from from Western Queensland into yeah. the coast and then down to Brisbane and then possibly down to Sydney, they they are you know really phenomenal distances. Uh, yeah. So it's like moving power all the way across Europe, moving everything into Russia. It's a huge huge distance that we've got to travel. How long do you think the infrastructure will take to actually put in place? Uh, Longer than we hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on. It's uh, 2023. We got to 2032. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Uh, well, look, you know, the best thing is we're getting started. Uh, yep. Planning, planning is underway for lots of different, uh, lots of different uh, infrastructure. I think that was one of the really interesting things about Adam's talk, is that. Uh, we do need to start to thinking about industrializing a lot of our processes and trying to standardize a lot of those to see if we can reduce time uh, for installation. But yeah, I, I mean, at the moment, each solar farm and wind farm is built bespoke. It's often, you know, unique developers and that, that kind of thing. So they're all doing it in a slightly different way. Right. So like every other kind of, it's not like renewables is a cottage industry, but it's a bit bigger than that. But like most industries, it's trying to scale up as, as much as we can. And, and yep. when you get that scale up, you get efficiencies of cost and efficiencies of time. So we are hoping that that, that, that is happening. Uh, but, and that's one of the benefits of having international companies and international participants over here. And why, how great it is to have conferences like this that they come, people can come and see the opportunities. We can learn off uh, international experiences as they bring bring those over here as well, and all of those should help us in the in the deployment challenge that we've got. And I think uh, I think one of the slides this morning I think it said 7.4 billion dollars spend. Was that is that right? And then you have to do that a, a five times increase. So it's about 30, 37 yes. billion. Yeah. How are you going to do that? Yeah. And so that was the sort of spend that we were doing between 2015 and 2022. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately the government is committed to that level of increase in spending. Uh, but, yeah, we're facing the same challenges that many other industries are at the moment, which is workforce challenges, supply chain challenges. Uh, so it is much more difficult than just allocating money in the budget. You've really got to uh, mobilize your entire uh, industry to start delivering these things. And a lot of that comes from delivering people a level of certainty about that supply chain. We're putting a lot of what we're doing and committing to in legislation so that people can sort of see, okay, there is a pathway here in Queensland. We can see how fast they want to do it and industries can start scaling up to meet that. Yeah. So uh, not easy, but um, we think that's the best way, you know, the best way of starting any journey and getting anywhere is getting started on your yeah. first few steps. It's, and <laughs> it's exactly right. Uh, if you don't start, you don't start. Don't start, yes. So uh, we have done that and you know, we'll, we'll try and accelerate and get up to a, a, a sprint uh, as, soon as, as soon as we can. Okay, is there any major projects is that the Department of Energy is currently working on? Any secret stuff? Uh, I'm sure there is. <laughs> and I couldn't talk too much about it, but the biggest projects that we have at the moment uh, uh, and that are, you know, are, we are ultra focused on is uh, having successful pumped hydro projects. Uh, so we've got two of them on the go. And I think everyone is familiar with the fact, we've all got our heads around the fact that wind and solar is intermittent and that we can't rely on it all the time, although wind's a bit better at night time than solar is. But uh, we do, we live in a country, in a state, which does get cyclones, uh, mm -hmm. which does get periods of still, stillness as well as uh, cloudy periods. And we have to be prepared for, for that. And for us, that means having giant storage available. And for us, we're of the view that the government and the community won't be confident in turning the coal off uh, yep. or turning the coal down until they're sure that they have sufficient supply, the, which is a reasonable request. It's, <laughs> it's a fair request. I need uh, to watch my Netflix. Yeah, yeah. So they. So, so how know, do the hydros work? For so someone they, that doesn't know, they uh, they essentially will they pump water from. Uh, one from a bottom level up to a higher level and they store that water on the higher level yeah. um, and the water that's being pumped up or the energy that's being used to pump it up is solar energy during the day. 
and they then release that water in the evenings through turbines uh, and those turbines can run for a, for a full day. Uh, to ensure that we've got sufficient sufficient supply. So it's a very simple technology that's been around for uh, a long time. Queensland had its first one actually at Wyvernhoe. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't realise that was a, a hydro. There is a hydro facility oh. there. It's just a bit smaller. It can only, it lasts about seven hours, whereas yep. the ones we are building at the moment can last 24 hours. Oh, wow. So the ones, the, uh, a project like Wyvernhoe can really sort of get you through an evening, but what we're sort of thinking, you know, a couple of hours during that peak demand period, what we're looking for is projects that can get us through a couple of days uh, okay. when you can have that yep. uh, low that low solar or low wind. So uh, that's the way we're thinking of meeting the Queensland's needs at the moment. Uh, they're really big projects. We're lucky in Queensland in that we have this uh, dividing range up the middle of the state, the mountainous region. It also rains a lot across that mountainous mm, yep. region. And essentially, if you are a country in the world that has hydro capability, that's countries like Canada or Finland, a few of us, they're building it. Uh, and we just want to make sure that Queensland takes advantage of its, its opportunities too. There's lots of countries around the world, like Japan, Korea, a lot, a lot of our neighbours in Asia, that just don't have those mountainous regions. No. What you really need for effective pump hydro is a, um, a short distance, a big sharp drop uh, right. between the top of their region and the lower region, and you can get that energy through the turbines uh, through that period. Um, of course, it's expensive, uh, and we've seen you know projects like Snowy Hydro, uh, which is um, you know we think a great project. But uh, of course, because we haven't been building these sort of projects in Australia before, and each pumped hydro project is kind of unique, uh, that you, you are sort of seeing some of those cost escal escalations. So right. uh, really challenging, but really exciting projects for people to work on. Cool, awesome. David, is there any last messages you'd like to pass on to the delegates here before we wrap up? So for us, it's mainly because for, for me, I'm sort of thinking that this is going to be a 15 year challenge that we've got. It's a construction challenge and it's really around everybody in the conference constantly explaining to people uh, when they go home uh, about why we're doing this transition. Uh, because people can get annoyed about particular projects and particular impacts, uh, but we really keep, want to keep coming back to making sure they're aware that we're doing this for a reason and that uh, it's an urgent problem and that uh, these are the best options that we've got. David, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for David Ushankney, the Deputy Director General of the Department of Energy.